Today we're going to be learning about the kinds of language you have to understand to interpret in a school setting, and then we'll focus in on special ed meetings because that's sort of this unique crossover of uh, legal interpretation and mental health interpretation and an academic language, and there's some special challenges there. Um, but lots of us uh, work in multiple settings, and so I know that I've had to interpret in school sometime. At, I used to be a, a teacher, and so I would just be the default guy that they called in to interpret because nobody <laughs> else spoke Spanish. But then um, sometimes after, after I got out of teaching and got into interpreting full time, I went back there. And so this is a, a very pertinent topic um, for our group. Um, Chicago, Mexico, welcome. I'm going to start out with our little uh, opening poll. And so you should see a pop up on your screen right now about the certificate of attendance. If you don't need a certificate of attendance, you can just end that and ignore it. But if you'd like one, please fill out those, those questions and answers. And the, I get a spreadsheet from Zoom when we're done, and I just export it over to the PDF maker that fills them out. So if you put your name in all, in all caps or all lowercase, that's how it's going to come out on the certificate. And so it'd be better to use initial caps for your first name and initial caps for your last name so that it's formatted nicely when it prints up. Um, and then once you're done, you can close that out. Um, if you didn't see a pop-up, it might mean that you're on an iPad um, or a, another tablet. I don't think the app running on the tablets will show the pop-up. And in that case, um, I don't know what else to do. Jing, Zheng, I can't share it again. It, it doesn't give me that option as the administrator. So if you don't see it, um, just get in the chat and say, um, this is my name. This is my email address. Please send me a certificate of attendance, and I'll try to pull those out of the chat as well. I, I spend... I spend more time working on certificates of attendance than I do on my job. And on um, and webinars, it's like 90% certificate attendance and then 10% webinar. That that that's the uh, that's the workload. And so I'm trying to like funnel everything through the system to make sure I don't leave anybody out and then you don't have to follow up in a couple of weeks and say, where's my certificate? Um, I haven't yet stumbled across the perfect way to do it for everybody. Uh, but also at the end, um, if you get on, um, when you're done with the meeting, there's a red button that says end meeting or leave meeting, and you should click on that, and then another little um, pop-up will show, which says, like, what's your opinion of this training, and please enter your email address again to confirm. Um, and I use that to see if you were here at the beginning of the meeting and, and the end of the meeting, and then I can, in good conscience, issue a certificate of attendance. So please don't leave the webinar by Xing out. In the top right-hand corner, there's an X that just closes Zoom. If you do that, then you won't get the, the closing survey. You want to go to the red button to, to close out. And I'll remind you again at the end of the meeting, so you don't have to keep track of all that. Um, I will leave up the poll for a couple more minutes if people are still filling it out. And um, the only other bit of uh, admin to do before Graciela takes over is uh, I'm going to share some links here in the chat. And you should have a little uh, chat icon that appears at the bottom of your screen. And there's four links. The first one is Graciela's own website, and she offers okay. training, um, lots of uh, online and in-person training, depending on the, the calendar and her availability. I, I hope you'll check that out. Um, then the second link is a webinar that I did with my wife, Margaret, about a month ago called Translation for Teachers. And so this is mostly interpretation today. That one is more about if you're working in a school setting and you get called on to translate, what are some shortcuts and best practices for handling that additional duty? Definitely. And then the third link is uh, the charity that we're supporting this month, which is Refugee Services of Texas. Um, and that's um, to provide assistance to families that are fleeing um, war-torn countries like uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Ukraine now, and are resettling here. And then the fourth link is just my um, YouTube channel. And if you want to know when the recording of this session is posted next week, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, and then it'll give you a little notification. And then if you miss anything today, you can go back and watch that part of the video again. This will be this is being recorded, and it will be on YouTube. So if you don't want your face uh, public, you're welcome to shut your camera off. If you don't care, it's nice to have some people on. I appreciate those of you who, who leave your cameras on. Um, and I would encourage everybody to, at some point, put something in the chat, because once in a while, People say they were here and they asked for a certificate of attendance, and I go, go go through the chat and I see, is their name in here somewhere so that I can verify that they were on the call? And so that's another way to demonstrate that you are participating. Um, as, as we listen to Graciela, 
If you have comments or questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get those at the end of her PowerPoint. And then we'll have a discussion time at the end if you'd like to, to visit more informally with your microphone off. So I think that's all the, the setup I, I was trying to get covered. And um, Graciela, you are a co-host now. So if you'd like to take over, I'm gonna put myself on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marco. It's such a pleasure to be working with Marco today and with all of you. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, you heard my name, Graciela Sosaya. I um, originally from Mexico. I have been in the language access industry for over 30 years. It is my passion. I am passionate about language access. I, um, I work for a language service provider. And I also, like Marco said, train interpreters, in, mostly in the um, uh, court and medical fields for now. Um, and that's all about me. There's not much. I'm located in Houston, Texas, originally from Mexico City, and here I am. So the one, the first thing I want to ask everyone, just a, a quick exercise, if you can do this on your screen, unmute yourself and then mute yourself back up. Perfect. And then if you don't mind also locating the chat, um, there's probably going to be a question or a comment that you would like to, uh, uh, to make as we move forward with the PowerPoint. And uh, make sure that you locate the chat so you can put your questions there. And like um, Marco said, at the end, we'll have a, uh, some time to discuss and a, a friendly discussion, and you will be able to ask other questions. But there's so many people. We're so fortunate to have so many of you today that we may not be able. And if we don't get to all the questions, uh, I'll make sure that I answer those questions, send them to Marco, and maybe, Marco, you can somehow make them available. There will also be a glossary of terms. Um, I speak Spanish, so my glossary is English and Spanish, uh, but even if Spanish is not your language, that may be, you know, an opportunity for you to say, okay, well, let me build this up on my own and add those terms that I'm unfamiliar with. So the, the glossary has the description in English and the translation into Spanish, but if you speak another language, very easy to work, um, to work it into your other working language. Um, and that's about it. So I hope uh, this presentation has some basic information for some of you. I, what I heard from some of you is that you have been interpreting in the educational field for a while. So may, you may find it, you know, mostly things that you know, but it may help us a reminder of other things. So you may learn something new. And those of you that are coming fresh new uh, to this, this field of interpreting, the educational interpreting, uh, you may, you know, you may find this information very useful. So I hope you enjoy it. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And off we go. All right, let me move. <laughs> I'm up there. I forgot that I have this screen. That I have, I'm going to make your images small, your videos small, so I can see my full screen because then, uh, depending on when my text, where my text is located on the screen, I may not um, be able to see it. All right. So, what are we talking about today? So, we're going to uh, uh, help understand the school and other educational settings, understanding the US educational system. What are the skills and knowledge needed to interpret in those settings and the modes of interpretation used in educational settings? We will also have some practice. So I, uh, I chopped down my, my uh, slides a little bit to allow time for all of us to practice together. All right, so what are the educational, what is an educational setting? Is any setting where people are gonna be uh, 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 gathered for learning opportunities, a learning environment, right? In this country, the, those institutions go from childcare, preschool, elementary school, high school, middle school, right? Uh, and universities. These uh, organizations obviously provide the space and the environment required for learning, 
depending on their student's age group. What is or how is the education system in the United States? It is comprised of public education, private education, homeschooling, and charter schools. Mostly as interpreters, uh, uh, we're called to interpret in public education settings, in charter schools, and sometimes in private education. But I find, I find that mostly it's public and charter schools. So in the United, and this is important because uh, depending on where the family or the student you're interpreting from, for is from, uh, in their own country, the mandatory ages for education may be a little bit different. I know in Mexico, for example, the uh, mandatory education is from age uh, five through age 16. And here in the United States is through age 18, okay? So this, uh, this uh, mandate or this requirement by the state can be satisfied in either uh, public or private or homeschooling programs. And then the mandatory education in this country is divided into three levels. You have elementary school, middle school or junior high school and high school. And, and for public schools, the, the, the state governments are the ones that, that mandate the curricula, they, they mandate standardized testings, and they supervise the colleges and state colleges and university. I put a comparison here. I know, I know that not everybody is from Mexico, but just to give you an example, and if you are working with people with, uh, from other countries, you may want to look up into how their um, education is structured. So when you're interpreting, uh, it, it does not leave room for confusion, right? Uh, both here in this case, uh, both the United States and Mexico demand 12 to 13 years of mandatory schooling. Uh, in the United States, like I was saying earlier, uh, it's uh, being in school is mandated until age 18. In Mexico, it's until age 16. So right there, right there, it can be a, a room for misinterpretation when you're interpreting for, for parents that are from Mexico. Elementary school in the United States is uh, kindergarten through fifth grade, mostly. Um, in Mexico, is first to sixth grade. Kinder in Mexico is preschool, is the equivalent of preschool in the United States. And preescolar or preprimaria in Mexico is the equivalent of kindergarten here in the United States. So, well, the terminology we use is, is very, very important uh, for people to be able to compare apples with apples, right? Then uh, here, uh, middle education or middle school or junior high is typically from sixth to eighth grade. In Mexico, it's the equivalent <laughs> of secundaria, and that's seventh through ninth. So, so, you know, I've heard a lot of interpreters say uh, uh, interpret secundaria for high school, and it's actually inaccurate. It's actually middle school or junior high. Then you have uh, high school from ninth to twelfth and uh, preparatoria in Mexico from 10, uh, uh, I'm sorry, from 10th to 12th, yes. For a second, I thought, oh, what did I do? No, it is correct. It is from 10th from to 12th. Then the grading scale here is from zero to 100, and the grading scale is in Mexico is from zero to 10. It's still the decimal system, but it means a lot. So if somebody in Mexico says, I got an eight, then they're very excited because they got an eight, uh, that means an 80 here in this country. So far, so good. All right, so let's talk a little bit about public education. Um, in 2021, there were 97,500 schools in the United States and an average of 528 stu students per each public school. This is, we're talking about uh, public education, um, elementary through high school. Some schools, of course, have a much higher student education uh, and some may have lower, but that was the average, okay? 
the uh, um, so in suburban areas, they say it's a little bit higher, 656 and 443 for students in towns. K through 12 schools receive about $640 billion uh, uh, in public schools, which makes you an average of $12,000, $12,600 per student, okay? Additionally to this, they also receive state and local funding about $734 billion. So that is another 14,400 per student. What are the expenses? What, what are, what are, how is this distributed? So a total of 57 million comes from federal government or uh, if we look at it at the student level, so let's say $1,000, $1,131 per student comes from the federal uh, government. $6,785 come from the state. And then 922 come from the level, uh, I'm sorry, local government, right? And it all depends on tax collection. So our taxes are at work. We can say that for sure. In Texas, there's a total of 5.8 million students enrolled. Uh, uh, okay, I, I, I put 5.8 and then the next one I put 5.9. Uh, and then about 300,000 or 350,000 are, are enrolled in private schools. We have about, I would say by now we, we have many more than this, but uh, back in 19, we had uh, 8,900 public schools. And then uh, fall enrollment in 2019, this where it was the only uh, information I could find, uh, was up 60% uh, compared to 1990. So that makes it 20 years, right? All right. So. We're going to change gears because I think most of you are more interested today in speaking about special education. This is what we are mostly called upon to interpret when uh, uh, in an educational setting. So we're going to talk about special education or the exceptional student, as we like to call them, and the admission process into uh, uh, a program of special education. So how does this happen? Uh, first, there has to be a, a classroom teacher referral. Then there has to go a notification. And I'm sorry, I had made this a very, uh, uh, how do you say, interactive page, but it didn't work. Uh, uh, it, was, it was supposed to appear one by one. So my apologies for that. Uh, then the notification and the request to evaluate goes to the parents. Once the parents uh, uh, approve that, the student will be evaluated by the school psychologist or will be referred for outside evaluation. Once this is done, there will be a conference with the parents to discuss the test result and determine whether the child is eligible to receive uh, special ed services at the school. Then will be an initial placement meeting and the uh, development of the individual uh, educational uh, pro plan, I'm sorry. Uh, the parents need to give their approval and there will be uh, re-evaluation meetings every three years or sooner if there are new developments or new results. So that is the general process on how uh, a child enters into the special education unless that child already comes from another school district or another organization already the, who, and has already been in special ed and then gets uh, admitted uh, or transferred, I would say, into the special ed program of that particular school. So where are we called to interpret when we come uh, in the educational system? We have uh, our, our ARD meetings, our ARD meetings, admission, review, and dismissal. That's how they're called in Texas. In other states, they're also called IEP meetings, which is the Individualized Educational Plan, which is part of the ARD meeting. Uh, there will be disciplinary meetings, classroom instruction, 
and parent-teacher conferences. Basically, I know there's many other instances, but these, these are uh, the, the four main, at least from the company that I work for, that's where we see that interpreters are, are called for to interpret mostly in educational settings. Marco, you let me know if at some point people are falling asleep, please. No, okay. I fall asleep with my own voice. <laughs> you got it. Awesome. Thank you. So let's talk about those admission uh, 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 review and dismissal meetings. Who participates in these meetings are the parents, always the general education teacher, and a, any special education teachers that may be involved in that child's CIP, and then a district representative or representatives, and of course, the interpreter in our case, right? The purpose of this meeting is to determine if the child is going to be eligible to receive special services, whether it's special ed, special accommodations, um, um, OT services or speech therapy. And it can also uh, offer referrals to other physicians if they feel it's necessary. During, based on the, on the, on the information discussed in that ARD meeting, then uh, a, an IEP plan is developed and uh, for that specific child if it's needed. What are some reasons for an ARD meeting? It may be the beginning of a school year. Every child that has been in special education will have uh, the, the, the beginning of the year will have an ARD meeting, okay? If a child is new, is a new student to the, that particular school, there would be an ARD meeting. If there is a mid-year review of current services, so throughout the year you have a beginning of the year kind of review, a mid-year review of the current services, and then the annual review at the end of the school year to see if, they, if they're gonna propose and uh, recommend the same services for a child for the following school year, things that worked and didn't work. Um, there's also an art is called upon if there's a new diagnosis, or if there is a request for a modification into their IEP, uh, or if the child has not been able to reach the goals that were set in the previous ARD meeting. So for any of those reasons, an ARD meeting can be, uh, can be call, called upon. So looking at the agenda, as, as many of you know, the, uh, the agenda for an ARD meeting is a long one. And we were talking earlier when we first started the class, it's also a legal document, right? So it has to follow a process and it has to follow the specific rules uh, during those meetings, okay? So the meeting has to be called in order. Uh, oh, first the parents have to sign the notice right there if they didn't bring a notice already signed. Then uh, the meeting will be called into order and introductions will be made by each person present. And then the statement of confidentiality will be read. So it will go something like this. All information discussed is confidential and may not be discussed with anyone except those who have a legitimate educational interest. As we proceed with the meeting, the first consideration of the committee should be the least restrictive environment in which the student can be successful. Why am I reading this? You can read it on your screen, right? but you will have to interpret this so uh, uh, simultaneously. So be ready, be ready with your language when you, uh, when you come with these art meetings. So what, is, uh, uh, what can be the different purposes of the particular meeting? It can be like we said, an annual, a review, a three-year reevaluation. It can also be an SSI meeting to determine what social security uh, uh, services the child may be eligible for. Uh, it may be at the parent request. Uh, it can be a, a determination of manifestation or an initial placement. All right. So then we move into the review uh, assessment, right? Uh, the FIE or full individual evaluation uh, do we need speech, psychological, et cetera, where they, re they review of all of these assessments. All of these assessments have both medical and uh, 
legal terminology that we need to be uh, cognizant of. Uh, then we will discuss what is the child's eligibility for special education services. We're gonna review the existing evaluation data or read all, all of these acronyms, right? Uh, then the parents will have an opportunity to bring some input, ask questions, uh, express any concerns, any issues they've been having at home and any recommendations or, or suggestions that they might bring before the committee. Then they're gonna review the platform. Uh, present level, oh, sorry, sorry, present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. Oh, hold on. And then what are the needs of this particular child? Is, uh, do we, does he need transition? Does he need a language report? Um, does he need to be placed in ESL or a bilingual program? Do we need a behavioral intervention plan? Are there any additional needs for the child as far as communication? Does the child have any physical needs or any physical limitations, any assistive technology? And all of this, as you know, comes with its own language, right? Is the child dyslexic? Um, so a personal story, I, I had a child, uh, I have a child who had, uh, who was uh, in special, uh, special needs uh, child growing up. And I attended this art meetings and I was completely clueless in my first meeting about uh, what the art meeting, I mean, all this terminology that they were throwing at me was so scary. Um, and the initial assessment was done at my house. Uh, they, the, the school district sent uh, um, an evaluator and an interpreter to my house. And uh, because they saw my name, so they automatically sent an interpreter. Uh, and then they spent it with this, that was a uh, God bless because all of those, all of the terminology that were talking to me about the IEP, about accommodations, about therapy. Uh, I'm sorry, was, was there a question? Okay. Uh, it was a new world for me after having two children that never needed uh, any, any special ed. This was very scary for me. And that meeting was wonderful. And the interpreter, insisted on interpreting. I told her, I am an interpreter. And she said, I have to interpret. I said, okay. So she was a really good interpreter, by the way. And, uh, and she was very good. She was on top of everything. And it gave me so much peace of mind. I, and I was thinking, had I not um, spoken English or understood English uh, well, uh, that would have been a, 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 a godsend for me. I could understand. So I was almost answering before even, uh, you know, allowing her to interpret. But uh, we're a godsend in situations like that. But that only goes to say how accurate we have to be. Um, sorry, I, I always have to preach something. Okay. So then uh, they continue in the art meeting to review the student current progress, right? So the general education teacher is gonna be talking about the students' programs in the general classroom. The speech therapist will speak their path, their part. The special education teacher will speak their part. And then there's a review of the old goals. And then what are the, what, which of those goals the child has already mastered? Then there will be uh, a report on the students' performance in the classroom and uh, they're going to be looking at the student's work if that is necessary. Not, not always. I don't remember ever seeing my child's work uh, when I was in the art meetings, but hey, never know. Okay, so we're going to review the IEP goals and objectives, the individualized educational plan and objectives. We're going to review accommodations. Does your child need more time? Do, do they need a keyboard to keyboard instead of handwrite? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Do they need to sit at the front of the classroom, um, or have a more uh, maybe test in a different room, etc. Then they're going to review the statewide assessment. So they're going to discuss the previous assessment done. Then the proposal of the STAR assessment. That is the uh, in Texas. That is the state uh, testing. 
Uh, will there be any accommodations necessary for the start testing? And then uh, uh, discuss whether there are other accommodations or considerations needed for the child. Then we move to district-wide assessments and accommodations. And then we talk about the uh, least uh, restrictive environment. So the very first thing that is gonna be considered, of course, is placement in the regular uh, general education classroom with, uh, and, and then it goes for them. But uh, where is the student, where can the student be adequately supported uh, in the least restrictive environment possible. Uh, uh, based on all of those considerations, a, a, an instruction setting will be recommended. Uh, potential harmful effects of that setting will be discussed, pros and cons. And then looking at the benefits, do they outweigh the harm? So everybody gets to have a say so. Then uh, there will be a schedule of the services, uh, a discussion of extended school year if necessary, a review of any supplements if necessary, so auditory impairment, visual impairment, or autism, um, any other ideas and suggestions and questions. So the parents, again, it has to be in disorder. Again, they're given the opportunity to ask questions or bring new ideas or suggestions. Then there will be the review of assurances, assurances I'm sorry, forgive my accent. Uh, and then again, this is kind of set in stone. Uh, it may be a little bit different in your school districts that you serve, but it's pretty much uh, um, a template, right? So uh, an example is this, when students with disabilities are provided services in a special education class, only if it is necessary to meet the child's needs. They will participate in all non-academic activities with their peers. They will be educated with non, I'm sorry, that should have been not on disabled, but non-disabled peers to the maximum extent appropriate. And the records will be maintained for five years following the date of the last recorded action. So that's another legal uh, assurance uh, that will have to be interpreted verbatim. Uh, then there will be a review of minutes and signatures. And off goes everyone. And like I said before, I will be sending Marco the glossaries uh, that have a lot of the um, terminology that is used in art meetings. We talked earlier that there's another kind of meeting that unfortunately some parents are called upon very frequently, which is a disciplinary action meeting. They're called to the uh, principal's office. And this happens when the student has broken the student code of conduct of uh, the school code of conduct or student code of conduct. You know, those papers that if you have your children in, in public education that you have to sign and your child has to sign at the beginning of every year, you know, tons of paperwork and the, the book that is this thick uh, as far as the behavior and the conduct that is expected from them at school. Uh, so what are the potential disciplinary actions? This is a conversation with the principal and sometimes the, the teacher, the student, and the parent. So potential disciplinary outcomes are student placement in an alternative education program, like a charter school. It can be suspension from the classroom or suspension from the school. It can be expulsion from the classroom or expulsion from the school and other limitations in enrollment eligibility. And last but not least, we, we talk as far as, as um, circumstances or meetings that you can be called to interpret upon in a school setting are the parent-teacher uh, conferences. So thanks to COVID, a lot of these are being done remotely now via Zoom, so you can appear remotely as an interpreter as well, but you know some of them are going back to in-person. So it's usually scheduled after a report cards go home uh, to discuss uh, their grades. Uh, the teacher is gonna talk to the parents about the strengths and of the child and the areas that she or he believes that need improvement. 
They will share the academic progress and growth that is based on what they have observed in the classroom, uh, the assessments that they have gone, done, and homework and assignments. That's, it's, an, it's a more informal conversation, not so much of a legal uh, uh, proceeding, uh, so to speak, or an official proceeding. There's an opportunity for the parents and the teachers to get on the same page. And then uh, the family can bring their concerns uh, in front of the teacher and address them. The parents will give input on their students' behaviors at home or what is the student saying at home, their personality, and what are the things that they believe their child is struggling through with or any special situations that may be happening at home that may be affecting the, the um, student's performance or behavior in the classroom. And all of this comes with terminology. All right. So what skills do we need in order to interpret in an educational setting? So our role is to facilitate clear communication between the instruction team and the student and his or her family. Clear, right? So language access, meaningful access, right? To make sure that, uh, to ensure that uh, the non-speaking, non-English speaking family or LEP family, limited English proficiency, uh, has the same opportunities as an English speaking family would. No more, no less. We're not there to give anybody an advantage. We're there to provide clear and accurate communication between people that don't speak the same language. So what, what are the skills that we need to have? Uh, we need to be impartial and that's a skill because we all have opinions. We all have a life. We have our own opinions of what's right and what's wrong. And, uh, and that's perfectly fine, but they cannot come into play when we're interpreting. Uh, we also need to be accurate and complete, right? Not skipping, and I know I'm preaching to the choir because I know there's a lot of very seasoned interpreters in this room today, but it's, it's always good to remember, right? Say what was said. If I heard it, I'll say it. If I didn't hear it, I will not say it, but I will repeat everything that I heard, right? Uh, confidentiality, of course, cultural competence. So we need to become familiar with the student population that we serve. Where are these parents come from? That is not only good enough for me to speak Spanish, but it's good enough to be familiar to, with, the, with the different cultures that speak Spanish in Latin America, for example, right? We all speak the same language, but we use it differently. And what may be Something funny in Colombia, for example, may be an insult in Mexico, may be a little bit offensive in Mexico and vice versa and many other countries. So we have to become familiar as much as we can with the cultures that we serve and also the language that is used by that population. Uh, another skill is being respectful, voila, right? So it's a good reminder, so respect for educators, students and parents. Right, I'm okay, you're okay. Professionalism, of course, and that goes in the way we treat everybody else, in the way we dress, in the way we respect, our, we present ourselves. And absolutely imperative is knowledge of the specialized terminology that is used in education. If you are interpreting in the classroom, then you have that your skill level, you know, just fast forward, it just increases exponentially. Right, I have so much admiration for interpreters that interpret, for example, in a, in a college or university setting, and they have to interpret those classes. So you pretty much become an expert on everything that you interpret. So you're gonna use consecutive interpreting, you're gonna use uh, simultaneous, and we're gonna use site translation. What are some of the documents that we may be asked to side translate right there on the spot? Uh, the child behavior rating scale, parent notifications, the termination of competencies, language proficiency assessment report, program modifications and support, the termination of participation in state and district-wide assessments, 
consideration for least restrictive environment and individual educational plan. And many more. Oh, sorry. So during an art meeting, anything that the parents sign or fill out will need to be site translated for them. Uh, simultaneous interpreting, when do we use this? Uh, during art meetings, when, when somebody is presenting a report, uh, et cetera, when anybody's speaking during art meetings, uh, but in both directions. And then it's also needed for classroom instruction. Obviously, imagine if the, if the professor is going, or the teacher is going to say one word and then uh, wait for the interpreter. Those becomes very long classes. And then consecutive interpreting really in any setting you're using in art meetings, when there's question and answer, conversational type. We use it in parent teaching conferences all the time. And then also in disciplinary action meetings. All right. So this is where I stop with my presentation. So we can do some practice. Let me see. Yeah, this is perfect timing. Um, let me stop. The share. Are we still awake? Yes. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for not falling asleep. <laughs> I'm very sensitive about people falling asleep when I speak. So, Marco, we had discussed uh, originally. We had discussed, you know, putting people in small groups and giving you a script so you could practice. But we have such a large group, wonderful group of attendees that what we think is better is I'm going to be reading the script. And uh, if you can just make sure that, of course, your microphone is muted, everybody at home is going to be interpreting into your other language. So I will be reading in English. You will be interpreting at home into your other language. Is everybody good with this? Yes? Awesome. OK. So get ready. Because here I come. Good afternoon, Mr. Smith. I am Peter's teacher in kindergarten at the elementary school. May I speak with you for a few minutes about a concern that we have in the classroom? Peter is a very sweet boy. He never bothers the other students and he enjoys stacking blocks. He does, however, appear to have some special needs where he may benefit from some of the services of our exceptional educational department at this school. The social worker feel that develop, developmental sorry, assessment um, last week, and it seems that you also have some areas of concern at home with Peter. Could you describe to me the concerns that you have? Our special education committee at school recommended that Ugo, no Ugo, Peter, sorry, undergo so, uh, some evaluations administered by a school psychologist and a nurse. I want to talk to you about some of those assessments. Some of those assessments are hearing, vision, and other tests that will measure his intelligence and independent behavior. We would like to ask your permission to have him evaluated.
How do you feel about this? Are you in agreement that Peter be evaluated? We will contact you as soon as we have the results of the evaluations so that we may meet and discuss the results. Thank you so much for your hospitality. Would you please sign this document? All right. Thumbs up if you did great. Thumbs sideways if you did so-so. Thumbs down if, you, if, if it was difficult. Yay, yeah. Sideways up. Yeah, good. I have another one. Give me just a second. I have a list, and this would be very helpful. Give me just a second. Marco, you have anything to say while I find my page? Yes, um, I'm, I have a link that I'm just shared in the chat. And if you want to click on that and save it for later, it's a, a mock special ed meeting being performed by actors, i.e. teachers at a school here in Texas. And they're oh, playing the roles of all the different people involved, the different teachers and specialists and parents and child. And just listening to them talk, I listened to it and, and was able to make a list of about a dozen special um, jargon phrases and terms that you only hear in that kind of a setting that would be good to add to your own glossary and have ready in case you hear them at a meeting like that. And there, there's other um, videos that are available free on YouTube um, from other states of special ed meetings there that would be good to review for your own personal training and practice. And that is a great resource. I find that when I build my own um, glossary, it sticks here rather than if I just add to somebody gave me a girl's glossary and I put it in my binder, for, for example, if I actually fill it out and, and go terminology hunting uh, or terminology fishing, uh, it, it actually sticks here. And then you don't need, even need to look at it. OK, so now we're going to be talking about the questions that uh, a parent uh, or a teacher asks about the child's behavior for the rating scale, okay? Uh, so this is a form that would need to be uh, uh, site translated. Please, describe, please answer each question about the child and write DK if you don't know the answer. So DK stands for don't know. My child often interrupts or intrudes on, on others. My child often argues with adults. My child does not seem to be able to control his talking. My child is often easily distracted. My child often blames others for his behavior. My child often does not seem to listen when spoken to directly. My child often blurts out answers before questions have been completed. My child often has difficulty playing quietly. My child often fails to give close attention to detail or makes careless mistakes. I feel my child is often angry and resentful. My child is easily annoyed by others. 
annoyed. That's that's a very specific term, and it's not uh, it's not specialized terminology. My child often does not follow instructions. My child often loses his temper. My child has difficulty paying attention to tasks or play activities. My child has difficulty waiting for his or her turn. My child is often on the go or often asks us if he or she is driven by a motor. And I apologize for my British accent. My child is constantly losing things. Schoolwork, toys, pencils, books. My child avoids dislikes or is reluctant, reluctant to engage in tasks that require mental effort. It looks like they're describing me. My child is often forgetful in daily activities. <laughs> All right, how did we do with this one? And this was just general language, right? We didn't, we didn't find any specialized terminology. I, you know, like I was saying earlier, I trained both medical and court interpreters and I always tell them what's gonna get you is not gonna be the medical terminology. It's not gonna be the legal terminology. It's gonna be your day-to-day -day language because that's where we get stuck says the voice of experience. Marco, how much time do we have left? Well, um, for the presentation, uh, we have uh, up to five more minutes. Um, okay. But, but this would be a good time to throw it open to discussion too, if, uh, if, you're, if you're ready for that. I'm ready. Yeah, okay. I'm totally ready. Um, then I'd like to uh, give you a round of applause. Gracias. Oh, Very good. Thank you. Very good training. Thank um, you so for having me here. So please don't go anywhere, anybody. Uh, we're not quite done yet, but when you do leave, um, it's important to click on the little red end button in the lower right-hand corner, because then the, the final survey will pop up and that's where you can confirm if you need a certificate of attendance, that's where you put your email address. Don't use the X in the top right corner because then you won't ever see the survey and it'll be harder to track down who was here. So the red button in the lower right. Um, but I am going to put these uh, links into the chat one more time. Some of you came in after these were added. Um, and these are links to Graciela's website where she has other training resources. Our webinar last month on translation in the school setting. Our fundraiser for Refugee Services of Texas and our YouTube channel where this video will be posted starting next week. But I would like to um, throw the floor open to questions. And I know a couple of people put questions in the chat. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask those now, let's just try to you know, take turns. And if you hear somebody else talking, then hold on a second. Frank, do you want to go first? I, yeah, I didn't hear uh, 504. Uh, I, I have a child that was uh, enrolled in the 504 plan. Is, is that something inside the, the subject of uh, special ed? It is part of the project of, uh, of the subject of special education. I didn't go much into the detail, detail uh, uh, of special ed or other programs in the school. Uh, I, uh, but that is something that we definitely can expand upon, uh, Frank. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think 504 is, is unique to Texas because that refers to a certain line in the statutes. It'll probably be different for other states. I, I think it's federal language. Okay. 504 is federal? I think 504 is federal, yes. At least okay. uh, that's my understanding in Massachusetts. Okay. Great. Yeah, my apologies for that, Frank, but I, I, I'll be happy to look more into it and give you information. Yeah, it's all right. Okay, Jesse, John, Jesse Thompson? 
Um, yes, the you mentioned that there needs to be respect for the parents, the teachers, and the students. What about respect for the interpreter? Well, yeah, of course, but you know, and, like and uh, how? What are? Can you give a, an example of how interpreters can stand up for themselves when, say, for example, people are not following good um, speaking protocol and kind of leaving them in the dust? Okay, so the only thing that we have control of, right, is, is the flow of communication. We don't have control of what is being discussed, what people are talking about, how they're talking about it, but we have uh, control over the flow of communication. So we can always raise your hand and say interpreter requests that you slow down so I can catch up and interpret. Interpreter requests that you pause more often. You know, it is, uh, so the expectation is that we will interpret accurately and completely, but a pre-session would be lovely, right? I, I have interpreter in a few educational encounters and on, uh, I found I never had an opportunity to speak to anyone and give them a pre-session, except for the parents. And they were the ones that needed it the least. You know, everybody else needed it because everybody was talking on top of each other talking super fast. Uh, so if you are able, and many times if you go to a specific school frequently, you can create that relationship. And even if you don't, right? To talk to them and have a pre-session and say, okay, let's talk about how to work with an interpreter. And don't use the word how to use an interpreter because I don't like being used. I don't know about you, but I don't like being used. So let me tell you to, to have a successful encounter what I need from you, if you please. And then just say, you know, speak in, uh, give me full ideas in short sentences, uh, you know, address people as you normally would, you know, the regular, our regular spiel on a pre-session, but you can set the rules ahead of time. And so people have it in mind. And then when they see you raising your hand, because you already said, if I raise my hand, it means I need you to stop talking then they're like, oh, okay, okay. Now I remember, you know, Jesse said to, to go slower or I, I find that pre-sessions are like a must in, in any area of interpreting that, that, we, that we practice. That's great, thank you. Thank you. What other questions or threads or comments? Yeah, one more question. Have you done this work uh, on Zoom? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, you, uh, so it, it works exactly, right? The, the client, uh, the school, depending on what it is, if it is consecutive interpreting, like for a parent-teacher uh, meeting, it's easy. We do it like this, right? This setting that we have right now, only, of course, there will only be three or four people on the screen and you can take turns very nicely. If it is an event that requires uh, for simultaneous interpreting, then there is a, uh, a, a license of Zoom that allows for the interpreters, allows interpretation for simultaneous interpretation. And, uh, and they will, you know, you have a room to interpret. It really, it works really cool. I've been doing quite a bit of those. Um, did that answer your question, Frank? Or did you have a specific question about about Zoom? No, no, uh, that's good information about the licensing because I, I was looking for that uh, feature. I never seen it. It's a, it, so normally the client will have it, the school will have it, right? And it's a very expensive license, very expensive license that, and they can activate it like for a couple of, of events and then deactivate it and then they just pay that. I don't know how that works. But basically what it is, is you, sorry, my song, my, my dog is singing. You arrive to the forum like this, right? And then they have, by your email address, you will be recognized as the interpreter. And they, they will create a room saying, for example, in, in, in our case, Spanish, right? And then they will announce and you will interpret, you know, if anyone speaks Spanish, please click on Spanish at the bottom of your screen. And then you as the interpreter will go into that room as well, just like if it was a breakout room. The difference here is the attendees that are in that room can only hear you. 
but you can hear the main speaker in English speaking at the same time. Interesting. And then if there are questions and answers, uh, you can get out of the room and come back, you know, for the Q&A. It's really cool, very cool. But it's for large groups. Like, let's say if we needed interpretation for, for today, this uh, is for large groups. Okay. Thank hey, you, let's Rosie. hear from Martha Rosenbaum and then Susanna Hendrickson. Well, schools receive a lot of funding, but they have from the government, the state and local, but they have the tendency to use teachers as translators. How, That's, yeah. how, how can we really change that a little bit? <laughs> so it takes a lot of education, right? Uh, uh -huh. I think interpret, as interpreters, we're constantly educating providers in all areas. And same happens uh, in healthcare, same happens in many other areas of interpreting. So it's the education. There is actually laws right, that demand that uh, language, uh, uh, meaningful language access is provided. There's uh, Executive Order 13166. So Executive Order 13166 was signed by President Clinton, and it expanded on the Civil Rights Act, uh, uh, um, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. So it was no longer just okay to not discriminate, now, if you receive federal funds, which public schools do, uh, you are obligated to provide meaningful language access to, uh, to your programs and services for limited English proficient uh, people. That's where the term LEP came from, from Executive Order 13166. And what meaningful access means is that if I don't speak English, and my child is in the school, I should have the same opportunities as an English speaker does. That's why you heard me say at the beginning, we're not giving advantages. We're not, we're, all we're doing is opportunities. And I say that because that goes hand in hand with accuracy and completeness and sticking to what is being said and not adding from our own um, wonderful experience in this world, right? So, uh, so there are laws that actually demand that if, if any organization that receives federal funds, whether it's $1 or $1 billion a year, uh, must provide uh, a meaningful language access. So you can start those conversations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Susanna. I think the ADA is, everybody knows about the ADA and American Sign Language. People are very much aware that they need to call interpreters for American Sign Language, but they seem sometimes to think that spoken languages don't deserve that much attention. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of education. It's because we have Google Translate now. We don't need people to do exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Susanna, you're up. Yes, hi. Uh, thank hi. you, Graciela. It's a wonderful presentation. I, I was just um, uh, interested. I was curious, actually, about something. Um, I, I finished interpreting, uh, I kind of retired from the courts and I've been doing school interpreting, which is what I used to do uh, earlier before I became staff at the courts. But um, what I've noticed is at least here in New York, um, the before pre-COVID, um, the school meetings, we, we call them CSEs, Committees on Special Education um, or Committees on special Preschool Special Education, but they used to be in person. And um, it, it really, at least, well, it, it was just so much better in many ways, you know, that I don't need to go over. But um, now post COVID or well, you know, kind of post COVID, um, I've noticed the interpreting I do, all the interpreting I do um, is through Zoom. And, um, and, and that is a huge pull uh, uh, on, 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 I think, any interpreter, really, not just me. I mm. fortunately, um, uh, I've been always practicing consecutive um, because consecutive is tough. At least I-, I It is. I have to have I, good I, memory I, skills. Yes, and good note-taking too. So, uh, you know, these, these meetings now are lasting an hour and a half. And sometimes I have two in a row, maybe a half hour, Oof. you know, in between. And I, I just leave these, these, these uh, assignments shaking because 
uh, the, the work has been so intense. And I'm just wondering if, um, if they've become uh, a, a Zoom environment for other states. I don't know what, it, I, I'm yeah. curious to see what other interpreters have to say about that. I, uh, I'm, I'm gonna venture to say, because I work for a, uh, a language service provider and that's what we do, right? We provide interpreters and we have many school districts uh, as clients. And uh, I, I can tell you they're at, at least uh, in Texas and a couple of other states, they're going uh, back more to in-person, but since uh, 20, what was it, 2020? Gosh, was it that long? I can't believe it. Uh, you know, Zoom is it, right? So there's a lot being done online, but I, we see a trend. So Zoom is not going to go anywhere. Zoom is going to is here to stay, but we see a trend uh, for in-person requests more and more. So it's, it's starting to, people are starting to feel more comfortable going out and having these this meetings in person. I just wanted to add one thing. I think one of the drivers, at least here in New York, is the fact that I think school administrators find that parents um, can participate more um, if it's through Zoom because yeah. of their work schedules and whatnot. They don't actually have to, you know, figure out how to get to the school, you know, during, uh, you know, the day when they may be working and they don't have to worry about that. And, and for school administrators, okay, let's turn on the, you know, turn on the laptop and uh, get that interpreter in here and let's go. And I just, I, I, I wish I could feel, uh, I, I wish I could feel that that's the trend in terms of, you know, going more towards in person, but I, 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 it doesn't. This is going to gonna help way. you feel better. This is going to help you feel better. I just had a conversation this past week with one of my, my clients with a school district. And what she was telling me is that the participation from LEP families has increased exponentially since they're able to uh, attend to these meetings from home. Because the same reasons you were saying, they, they may not have transportation, uh, they may feel so many times they feel uncomfortable. The, the land Americans, unfortunately, at least uh, my experience has been are the ones that don't show to this, don't show up to these meetings. They're, they're, um, uh, how do you say, you know, they feel they're scared, they're nervous. Uh, these meetings scare them. So being able to attend from home has increase the, the, the attendance by these parents. And so you're being, you know, you're facilitating that. So that, you know, put like a star on your shoulder because that's, uh, that's a positive thing that you're doing. But I, I do believe, you know, uh, New York had it so tough with COVID, right? And I think that uh, people got very, very scared and are more reluctant to go back in person, but people, uh, but it, they will. Once people start feeling more comfortable, I think that they will. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear from Alejandra Mendez next, and then Jesse. Hello. Hello. How are you? It was a great presentation. I was just um, adding to what Susana mentioned about the arts taking place still via Zoom. I work for Dallas ISD and we have about probably less than 10 interpreters that cover the whole district, hundreds oh you know, of ARDS that cover it's the Spanish part of, of it. Mm -hmm. And it all the ARDS as of right now, I would say 95% of them are still taking place via Zoom. And Online. it's true. They're about an hour and a half and they are emotionally exhausting when you're done. And we cover our interpreters are working remotely, probably doing um, three, sometimes four. Plus, if we have evening meetings, they'll cover the evening meetings as well, which are like PTAs or and other Alexander, community let me meetings. Ask you a question. I'm sorry, I mm -hmm. interrupted you. Sure. No, 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 go ahead. Um, have you seen that trend? Have you seen, have you noticed if, if the, uh, the, the meetings for, for example, Spanish speaking families, the number, the volume of those meetings has increased since you guys have gone online? I believe there's more parent participation precisely because of what you were mentioning. It's easier, mm -hmm. you know, especially those evening meetings, the community meetings, you have sometimes parents participating from the kitchen. They're yeah. preparing dinner. You know, they're able to participate from their car. So yes, there is more participation. How sometimes for um, 
I would say I talked to a teacher just this week that asked to have the interpreter in person for those initial arts that take a little bit longer explaining to the parent. But as of right now, with the staff that we have, we're still, we're keeping them virtual. Every once in a while, we'll go into schools. I mean, obviously the kids are back in schools, but we'll go into the schools as requested. Yeah, and I think that that uh, the, that part of the problem, if, if we want to call it that, is that, uh, you know, kids are back in school, but they're still controlling the number of people coming into the school that don't Correct. necessarily need to be there, right? Just as they're doing with hospitals and courts and many other places. This is, I, I mean, uh, COVID has been fantastic. I, before COVID, I'm going to tell you how many judges I spoke to about remote interpreting. No, no, in person, no. Now you cannot get them in the courtroom. Now it's like, yeah, Zoom, please, WebEx, whatever. They're so happy. Yes, uh, right now, I think the ones that we're doing in person are the community meetings, but even that, when the numbers spike, we'll go to doing the Zoom interpreting, like you were mentioning with um, the interpreter feature on Zoom, which That's is really right. nice to have as well. It is very nice. I, I think it works beautifully. And it, you know, the, the, there's a lot of disadvantages to Zoom and as interpreters, yes, if you're, you know, I'm not interpreting currently, but I, I work in front of the computer all day long and I have meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. I'm in front of a camera all day long, right? And that by itself can be very exhausting. But uh, right. the, the good thing about interpreting services is that there's more availability. You can have the interpreter there, you know, like this, Instead of the interpreter having to, you know, commute all the way to the location, and that makes uh, you, for example, if you're a freelance interpreter, you have the opportunity to make more money in a day if you don't have to commute to all these appointments, these assignments, right? So it has its positive side as well, um, I think. Okay, let's do one more question from Jesse. Yes, um, I related to Marta's question um, about um, teachers interpreting. Um, yes. Can there be any legal liability or, or consequences for that? Well, are, are there any organizations trying to formulate a set of um, qualifications like court interpreters have? Uh, there are uh, or educational I, interpreters. Yeah, I don't think there is a push on the government side of things. Uh, there is a huge push on on the interpreter associations, like uh, national associations, to push for certification for educational interpreters uh, because it is needed now. Um, is there uh, what can happen? So if the school gets surveyed by the state, that suddenly the state says, you know what? Where's your language access plan? Because the federal government is getting tough on us and the federal government is getting more strict in general about language access plans uh, starting last year and this year, because I've been, I, I deal with a lot of government companies. So I hear from my clients, right? You know, can you help us create a language access plan? And so, uh, so if, if the, the district will say, okay, I'm going to this elementary school, for example, uh, where's, where's the language access plan? And if you don't have it, let's say the district can say, we, we have to withdraw funds because those federal funds, part of what those federal funds are covering is language access. And I saw a question, I think, uh, Diana, you said, where would we find these laws? Just Google executive, I'm going to type it in the chat room, executive order 13166, and you will find it. Um, I know where it can be found is the class standards for healthcare organizations. So Minority Health, the Office of Minority Health uh, has created a whole plan based on executive order 13166. That applies to any type of organization, but um, were there? And I've I've heard of that executive order, but um, my question relates more to um, what sort of 
teeth there are in that regulation? Like what enforcement is okay. either under construction or exists? Because I think it exists. Now, I'm not sure how the chain of command uh, trickles down to the, to the individual school, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But the federal government has the right to withdraw fund, funds for education for a specific uh, or the, uh, I, I, I think it would be the state education department would be number one, and then the federal government would be number two. They can withdraw funds. For, for instance, I can tell you in healthcare, uh, Medicaid and Medicare can withdraw funding from a hospital if they don't have interpreters. If, if, they, if, they, are, um, uh, if they are working, you know, staff, using staff members to interpret, uh, staff members that have not been previously tested and qualified as, as interpreters. So there are uh, very strict laws. I just don't know, not understand very well how it trickles out on the education side. Marco, are you familiar with that? Um, not, not very familiar, but I, there is a federal um, web page that I just put a link to in the chat where you can file, anybody can file. Oh, LEP, yeah against a school district that is not um, providing uh, adequate interpretation. Education, interpretation. And I would, I would caution you not to rush into that. It's better to first talk to them and um, help them become aware of their responsibilities. And, and then if you get pushed back and, and they're not interested in meeting the needs of the immigrant communities they serve, then eventually that's like your, your last option before actually um, suing them yourself. It is, it has, pretty much become a civil right. So it's as serious as a, a violation to civil rights.